dollars of gas a week. We had sometimes lit up the streets to the point that it looked like a fog. We said, hey, they're trying to take over my country, and I'm not going to permit that to happen. The Dow demonstration is the first violent anti-war demonstration to take place on a university campus. Now, in the next three, four, or five months, once you hit 68, everything is going to pop. But I think Wisconsin is the first, and Dow, and Dow was, was the bell. The anti-war movement from that point on just grew larger. A few days after Dow, there was a protest in Washington, really the first massive anti-war protest at the Capitol. When the Tet Offensive comes three months later, public perceptions changed forever from that point. That was the point where the American public essentially concluded that Vietnam was not worth fighting and unwinnable. From the time these black lions were killed that day, from the time of that protest in Wisconsin, the people responsible for the war essentially knew that they couldn't win it. Well, it went on another eight years, and that's another part of the tragedy. When we flew home, I was with two guys that I knew. We took a taxi cab to the San Francisco airport. And the taxi cab driver talked about the price of tires and the traffic and never quite got around to saying, hey, welcome home, or how was it, or good luck. And uh, I thought that this is probably a sign of things to come. I mean, I knew my parents would be happy to see me. I didn't know if anybody else would be happy to see me. So I knew I was going to have one good friend, me. And so I sent a letter home to myself. And I actually opened that letter when I got home. I mean, there wasn't no brass band waiting on you. Uh, nothing. You weren't a hero. You lost the war. I was pretty bitter. I, I, I considered those people to be traitors. I mean, traitors, cowards, and any other dirty name you could come up with. As far as I'm concerned, they can line those people up and shoot them right between the eyes. That's a pretty hard to stand, but that's the way I feel about it. My mother and father were both lost to the war. So now there's only me. Nobody else. My wife's family is also completely gone. Only her left. All lost to the war. My house is on the battlefield where we fought that day. My neighbors ask if I'm not afraid with the ghosts of all the dead Americans tugging at my feet. You know, nobody gives up their life for their country. They have their life torn away from them. Nobody, nobody gives up their life for their country. None of my guys signed up for that. I see their faces, and that's what hurts so much. You know, they're so young, to die so young for a needless cause. It's a high price to pay for something that's wrong. And as you look at it now, you know it was wrong. We had no business being there. I'm not ready to give up on Vietnam as a force for good, OK? I'm not ready to admit that was an evil thing that happened 
to the United States of America that never should have happened, or even that it wasn't worth it. Now, part of that is because I can't accept the deaths of my buddies as not being worth something. I've had many years to reflect upon my decisions and my actions and realize where I acted stupidly and in haste, foolishly and cruelly. But I have never changed my mind about the wrongness of the war in Vietnam. You need to have people who are willing to stand up and take action when they think something is wrong. I mean, that's what a democracy is all about. It changes who you are. When you put that kind of time and that kind of effort into, into a cause, you emerge from that different. And I think we emerge from that absolutely less optimistic, absolutely less hopeful. We were committed and willing and wanting to give everything. They didn't want it, and we stopped giving it. And the fact that it's not around now in the way it was then, I think is extremely harmful to the country. I think every country needs the kind of idealism that we had. I have only respect for the men who fought in that war because they didn't make the war, they didn't choose to fight in that war, but they accepted a responsibility that they thought was theirs as an American citizen, okay? They carried the burden of being an American citizen. When they were sent to war, they fought. And I carried the burden, not at all comparable, of being an American citizen by opposing that war. And I had the choice, and they didn't. And for that, I was privileged, and they weren't. But we were both doing our duty. I think back then, if people tried in any way to stop the war, they probably felt that they were doing the right thing. On the other hand, the boys of Vietnam felt they were doing the right thing. In the end, I wonder who was right.